Hi there. This is a Patreon Q&A video, something I've never done before and I have no idea how to do, but I'm going to give it a shot. I actually don't even watch other people's Patreon Q&A videos. Well, Adam Neely. I watch his. Are those patrons or just comments? I'm not sure. See, here's the thing. I get tons of interesting, thoughtful questions in my YouTube comments. I thought when I started doing this channel that I wasn't going to get really anything that I felt like responding to. I mean, really, I just didn't think I'd get anything. Like, I started putting up videos pretty much so I could link them to friends, and I figured nobody would ever notice I was doing this, but obviously several people have noticed. I thought when I started getting more views that the comments would all be, shall we say, dumbasses and pricks telling me that I'm wrong, I'm stupid, I'm ugly. That happens once in a while, but not nearly as often as I expected. I mean, at best, I thought I would just be getting a lot of comments that are like, nice video, no caps, no period. But instead, every time I post something, like within 20 minutes, somebody posts a question that's really interesting and something I didn't think about in weeks or months of research and script writing. And immediately I'm like, ooh, I want to get into that, but it's not enough for a whole other video. And I also can't just go into it in the comments because I get so many of these. However, there is a set of people who, unsurprisingly, I focus a little more of my time and attention on, and that's the people that are paying me to do so. I asked my patrons if they had any questions they'd like me to answer, and true to form, they sent me some that were <laughs> a lot better than, no offense intended, I had expected. I was thinking uh, like I was going to get, what got you into this? And instead I got, uh, what is your emotional connection to the devices you have sitting in storage? Do you feel sad for them? So, um... Thank you all for effort posting. Uh, I'm going to treat all your questions as like freeform narrative prompts. So let's see if I sit here and talk for an hour. Also, I should mention the chair I have doesn't actually fit this desk. I, I should be sitting like about here. So I'm kind of sitting on my leg to get up to the right height. And I'm going to look uncomfortable the whole time. No Mods For Real asks, what would you recommend as a good beginner camcorder for sports, namely skateboarding? Is it worth going with something from the 90s or just dish out the cash for a GoPro? I've never done this kind of work and I don't know what I'm talking about. Take this with a grain of salt. If your question is whether a 90s camera will work, well, sure. I mean, anything that shoots DV video or better. Like, I don't think you really want to shoot like high 8 like analog video in this year of our Lord. You're going to want something digital. But... I mean, it worked for skate videos in the past and it'll work now. You can see what the person is doing. Skate videos are not generally about the highest visual quality or like cinematic production, at least from what I've seen. It's more about what the person is doing and whether it feels impressive and dynamic. All the DV camcorders I've seen before have had pretty much the same image quality and you can get them now for a song. So as long as you put a fisheye lens on there, which you usually can, then anything will do really. Now, if your real question is, should you specifically pursue a 90s camcorder, you know, like a Sony VX1000, uh, then, I mean, we'd have to talk instead about why skaters are obsessed with the VX1000. I don't exactly know. There are articles about it. Hell, I think there might be a documentary about it somewhere. But personally, if you ask me, it's just because it was there at the right time when skate videos were getting really big. Uh, in the mid to late 90s when people were doing like underground videos and like dubbing them to VHS by hand with like illegal ska soundtracks, that's when that sort of camera was the best thing you could get. I don't think there's anything about the quality of 90s video technology that makes it particularly special uh, for this purpose, uh, but there's just people out there that are trying to keep the dream alive. You know, they were either there in 1996 or they wish they were there in 1996, but either way, they're just trying to do what people were doing in 1996 in order to just LARP living 25 years ago. But I mean, you certainly don't have to. If you take a look at like uh, maybe what Braille Skate is doing, I'm not necessarily promoting Braille Skate, but I'm just saying that's the last time I watched a skate video, okay? <laughs> They're shooting on HD cameras and it looks just as dope as what people were getting in the 90s. It's just higher quality. It still feels dynamic and real. Uh, but they're also not doing that whole thing where they say skateboarding is not a crime and then like slam into random pedestrians who are just going about their own business. So I think that sort of outlines the stylistic choice here. You get a 90s camcorder if you want to pretend you're Bam Margera and pee on your dad. Well, I don't want you to come in here and pee on your dad. Pee on your dad. If you're not doing that, then you just want something that's going to be robust, that'll get dynamic looking footage, and most importantly, will show off the skater's skills. Almost any modern camera with a fisheye lens should do that. 
I'm sure there's lots of YouTube reviews that actually test cameras for this purpose. Uh, I can't give you any specifics, unfortunately, I've never looked into it. What I wish I could recommend, though, is a thing called the VX Legacy, uh, which is literally a lump of polyurethane in the shape of a Sony VX1000 with a cavity in the front that you shove a GoPro into, which seems absurd, except holding a GoPro to do skate videos is really tough, and this puts a handle on top of it, which is one of the big reasons the VX1000 was popular to begin with. As far as I can tell, they never made any, or if they did, they're like long gone now, but honestly, that's pretty cool and would be my recommendation if you could just grab it on Amazon. Pulsar asks, what's your background in video production? Is it just a hobby you're interested in, or have you done professional work in the past? It's 100% hobby. Um, I've never done this commercially, unless you count what I'm doing here, and I don't. I've had to learn everything from just reading and watching videos and experimenting, uh, which is part of why I always feel a little uncomfortable trying to make assertions about how certain features are used or what value they offer, because particularly with the pro cameras, I've never been in a situation to use almost any of their capabilities. I've never pointed a camera at another person in anger, as it were. I've always wanted to do that. I've always wanted to work as a camera operator or a producer or an editor, at least for a little while, uh, but I don't think I'm anywhere near the necessary skill level I'm not part of the industry. I don't know if it would pay what I actually need to live, etc. cetera. Um, I don't think it's really the job for me. Um, I've just been interested in video my whole life. Like since I was a little kid, I was just obsessed with, with camcorders. And uh, when I started finding interesting video cameras, which I'll touch on later, uh, I just decided to start aggressively teaching myself this, this stuff. Almost all the information about pro video in the industry feels like it's probably taught by oral tradition. Uh, it's almost been like a challenge to myself to learn how to work this equipment I've been collecting without any tutorials or much in the way of like thorough documentation. So uh, I wouldn't recommend anyone take anything I say here as any sort of expertise. And I try to frame it that way when I can to like remind people, hey, I don't know what I'm talking about. And I suspect that doesn't entirely solve the problem that I speak with more confidence than I maybe should. Uh, but I decided a long time ago that the stakes here are low enough that I shouldn't beat myself up over that sort of thing. If this were something that mattered more, then I would maybe just tell myself, hey, look, man, you shouldn't be talking about this stuff because when you say stuff, people believe you. <laughs> I just, I have that quality. But here, like, come on. I mean, what does it really matter? If I get something a little wrong, is somebody going to like get fired from their job? Is somebody going to like get into the wrong industry? I, I don't think so. Trey Poor asks, what piece of equipment has really surprised you? For example, something you expected to be terrible that was awesome, or something you thought was simple but was very complex? This is an interesting question because really, um, this happens all the time. Like, I'm really prone to prejudging things and uh, then finding out I was wrong about them, and usually I figure that out before I make it to shooting, but sometimes I don't, and then everyone has to tell me in the comments. Uh, I don't know that I can name a specific thing I was impressed by in this way, but I can say that it happens in a lot of small ways. Those late model DVD and Blu-ray cameras from my disc camcorders video, those ended up being a lot better than I expected. Um, I expected them to be a lot cheaper and crappier and shoot lower quality video, uh, but they were actually pretty good. I, I was pretty satisfied with them. I would have loved to have one of those when they were new. Uh, as far as simple versus complex, um, well, P2 card was pretty wild. I didn't expect a RAID controller in there, you know? That was totally out of left field. Um, the most on-point example would probably be the Beam Index Color Viewfinder, because I thought that thing would just be a normal black and white video tube when I bought it for like $6.99 at Goodwill. It, it sits for like two years, and I finally discovered that I've been sitting on one of the most sophisticated color CRTs ever made. I mean, I think that's probably the obvious example. I could also maybe say that the Apple II and ZX Spectrum computers, uh, I was convinced those were garbage for like a decade, but in the last couple of years, I really developed an appreciation for both of them. Um, if you've seen any of my, my Sunday streams, I haven't done one in a while because life's been complicated. And also because somebody told me that if I do those streams on my main channel, it'll mess up my like algorithm performance because I don't get nearly as many views as I do on my other videos. And I'm worried about it, but I don't have any way to prove it. Like, not that I don't trust that you are you know, speaking what you believe to be the truth, but I just don't have any way of verifying that that's true. And people have all sorts of wild ideas about how YouTube works. So I'm not sure if I should just continue streaming on here or make a separate channel that'll never get nearly as much, you know, viewership or, or what to do. So I've kind of suspended those for the moment. You can go back and, and see the VODs they are saved on my channel. Anyone who's seen them will be able to tell you that I put a lot of passion into exploring the games on the ZX Spectrum because it's very easy to open up a game, play it for 15 seconds and go, ah, oh, this sucks. But if you put a little more effort into it and get over that initial hump of like, this isn't a game from the NES, this is a game from before, right? Before they knew how to make games. 
if you can get yourself over that hump and learn to appreciate something that is from the before times, as it were, but was still intended to be good and was enjoyed by people in its heyday, there's actually a lot more meat on those bones than you'd expect. The ZX Spectrum is such a limited computer that it's really shocking what dedicated programmers were able to achieve with it and how fun some of those games can be for being completely different than anything that you've ever seen before. A lot of them are concepts that are, are totally unique among every game console and, and system I've ever seen. Um, and it kind of makes you think, wow, what if these had gotten a life of their own and we gotten more games like this instead of, you know, pretty much a couple dozen genres and, and that's it. So I could say that the ZX Spectrum as a platform counts here, but really I think I've just become more patient and open-minded in general over the last couple of years. So this could probably apply to a lot more things. Adam Egan asks, if you could, would you make YouTube a full-time job? Uh, okay. This is weird. Um, the idea of thinking about that right now is wild to me because so no offense intended. Okay. I appreciate everybody who's watching this and I get that like I've earned the viewership I have, but 25,000 subscribers is not a quit your job number of subscribers. All right. <laughs> it just isn't. Um, the people that I see quit their jobs, um, to do this full time are looking at like a quarter million or something. And I don't want to be like, Oh, 25,000. Like, uh, nobody even knows I exist. Come on. I'm not saying that's nobody. I'm just saying that this is not typically how that narrative goes. And the idea of doing it now or in any time in the near future is just wild to me to, e to even bring the, the question up. It's, it's like asking somebody running a lemonade stand. So if you thought about going into competition with Minute Maid, but hey, uh, putting that aside, uh, would anybody say no to this? I mean, <laughs> if you were just handed, uh, you know, sign this paper and you can quit your dead end job and go do freeform creative work indefinitely, would anyone say no to that? I, I mean, there must be somebody. I'm sure there's people watching who are like, no, I don't want to be in the public eye. No, I, I couldn't keep up that kind of output. Well, I couldn't keep up that kind of output if you ask me, right? This is assuming a lot. This is assuming that I could put out a video every week. You know, I haven't been able to make it four months without having a substantial break due to, to life situations changing. So, you know, I would have to be able to commit to, I would say, weekly videos indefinitely, you know, for, for years. It would be my, my primary income. Um if my quality level dropped and people started dropping their subs, then I can't buy food, right? That's terrifying. The number that I settled on that I would have to get to before I would feel safe doing this sort of thing is $6,500 a month on Patreon. That's, I, I added up a whole bunch of stuff and like you, you take into account taxes and everything. That's that's what it comes to. It's it's a ridiculous figure and I'm nowhere near that, right? So, I mean, right now I'm at about uh, $1,300 and then I'm losing some of that to taxes. So, I'm nowhere close to being able to do it practically, but I think the bigger problem really is I don't know how I would do it mentally. I think I would have to change a number of things about how I do videos. To be utterly frank, I would have to start producing filler content. Now, that's not a dunk, okay, because there's a lot of other YouTubers who do exactly what I'm about to talk about. I'm not saying it's bad, but to do a video every week, at some point, you just got to start doing stuff where, you know, I would come in with a camcorder, set it down and say, this is the Sony TRV 96C and it takes infolithiums and here's all the controls. It came out in this year. Let's look at the bottom. Let's look at the front. Let's talk about how the lens cover opens. Let's look at the video quality from it. But in my head, I'm going, it's the same as all my other mini DV cameras. I don't care about this. Who cares about this? What's the point? It's the same as all the others. It's nothing special. There's no narrative attached to it. It's very hard for me to do a video about something that doesn't have a big narrative attached to it. Have you noticed this? Have you noticed that all my videos are like, <laughs> I, I try to avoid the clickbait, right? Which is ironic because I could clickbait the hell out of my videos. The theme of all my videos is you won't believe this one weird trick discovered by a camera manufacturer in 1992 it would be very hard for me to shift gears from, you know, every single thing I work on being big, being a big story, as big as I can make it to here's another camcorder out of my collection of 60 camcorders. Here are its stats. So like I said, not down on anyone who does that sort of thing. It's just not how I work. And I know a lot of people here would watch that, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's nice in this very difficult world to have a familiar voice, uh, talk, about something you're intrigued by for 30 minutes every week, right? Having that available is wonderful, but I just don't think I'm the person to do it. That said, pay me the money. I'll do it <laughs> for the money and the freedom. Uh, if you ran my Patreon up to that kind of figure, 
then I would do it. No problem. I would figure it out. I would change whatever I had to. Here, I just put the goal on my Patreon before I shot this video. You get that number up to 6,500, I'll think about it. Gloomy JD asks, if you could go back and change one thing in the history of consumer AV gear, what would you change? HD video catches on earlier. Simple as that. This might come as a surprise, but I actually don't like standard def video very much. <laughs> Imagine that, but it's true. I was always frustrated with it. Um, as far back as I can remember, before I even knew what HD was or that it was coming, I always wanted the pictures to be clearer. Uh, what I've learned in recent years as well is that we had opportunities to do this sooner. There was HD technology uh, as early as the late 80s. We could have switched to HD sooner than we did, other countries did, Japan in particular, and we just didn't. In 2005, I was rocking a 1680 by 1050 LCD on my PC, but I couldn't get a movie that didn't look like VHS, and that was a real bummer to me back then. Uh, it also sucks that because we didn't have HD cameras sooner, the market for used ones is absurd. Even consumer trash from years and years ago just won't drop below $100 uh, if it can do 1080 at any bit rate, any frame rate, any noise level. I mean, check this out here. I'll uh, probably do an overlay here. This is a Canon Vixia R700, the first camera I got for YouTubing uh, that wasn't total garbo. I had a Sony before this that was just trash. Um, but this one is still at least four years old. It's basically the most bare bones camera you can buy. And this listing that I found is no battery, no AC adapter, which is proprietary, of course. Uh, it's scratched and beat to hell, and it's still $150, no free shipping. And, and if you blink, the price shoots up. You go one notch better to anything that isn't total stocking stuffer sludge, and the price hops to like $400. HD camcorders are over a decade old, and you still won't see one on a thrift store shelf. You go into a Goodwill, and you'll see VHS, 8mm, once in a while DV, that's it. And it's absurd, and it's unfair. Forgive me for putting it this way, but... I think the secondary market is one of the only functioning examples of trickle-down economics uh, that ever existed. In the past, it went sort of like this. Um, the rich buy toys, they get bored with them, they throw them away at a thrift store or charity shop so they can make a tax write-off uh, instead of paying for dump fees, uh, and then the poor get to buy something that should be way out of their price range. Ask me how I know I was flat broke until I was in my mid-20s, and every piece of technology I got came from a thrift store. Now everything's wrecked. The thrift stores either got greedy or people stopped dropping stuff off or a, a mix, I don't know. But now if you're poor, congratulations, Goodwill will charge you $18 for a camcorder that was an antique in 1999. Plus it's broken. If we'd started getting HD camcorders in like 2002 though, like we conceivably could have if we pushed the envelope a little bit, some of that stuff might be on the secondary market at this point. You know, we will never know and maybe the technology wasn't there yet, but hey, this is my fantasy, right? John Drobny asks, something that's come up more than once is how advancing tech, like a tape to digital video, made techniques that would have been impossible suddenly not just possible, but really easy. Is there anything notable that we've lost access to as tech changed? Like the sort of blurry video tube effects uh, from the Red JVC, where emulating it today would require some hard work. That's a tough one. Uh, focusing on the specific example you gave, I can't think of any video effects that were easier in the past, like on analog cameras, uh, that digital made harder to achieve that are really that appealing. I mean, the uh, the streaks from analog video tube cameras, which are called comet trails, by the way, are neat, but I don't think they serve that much of a purpose. I don't know that any cinematographer or videographer would really want to use those in a modern production. There are some things I think we've lost that are sort of tangential, though, so forgive me if I'm cheating on this question. I had a hard time putting words uh, to much of this. I don't think I really have a direct answer, but I did settle on one thing that's always bugged me about the progression of uh, video in particular as regards uh, recording technology, uh, which is that digital storage got uh, really big and really generic, and that abstracted recorded media from the medium that it's recorded on. Um, but let me, let me rephrase that in a way that makes a lot more sense. In 1990, you might buy uh, like a Hi8 camcorder and shoot video of a birthday party, uh, a soccer match, a wedding, and a fist fight all in one week, uh, all in one day if your family likes things spicy. There's a good chance that you'll then throw that tape in a box and not touch it again for years or decades. And the next time you go out to shoot something, you'll just grab a fresh tape, maybe stop off at Walgreens and pick one up. 30 years later, you find your tapes in a box. They still work. They've still got the old footage on them. You can watch them still and, and you know remember things that happened a long, long time ago because that video is stored on those tapes unless you explicitly remove it. 
and you're probably not going to explicitly remove it. And of course, maybe another 30 years later, someone buys those at your estate sale and they get to see elements of your life that would otherwise be forgotten. So whether you feel like this is an invasion of your privacy or not, which is a topic of some debate among people who buy used things, you are now part of history, right? You have not faded into complete oblivion. Some physical record of your existence has been retained and preserved. Well, nobody does that now. Uh, nobody buys a 20 pack of SD cards and just, uh, you know, shoots something and then throws the card in a shoebox when they're done shooting. Uh, they copy the files off to their PC and then they wipe the card and the hard drive eventually dies and then all those videos are gone. What's gonna happen to this video when I'm gone? I mean, YouTube will go away eventually and they'll delete this for sure. No one's gonna bother to preserve it. Uh, so the original media, that's gonna be completely gone. I mean, I'm gonna wipe this SSD almost as soon as I finish uploading this video. Uh, there might be a finished copy of it somewhere on one of my hard drives, but someday those are either going to die or whoever gets them after me is going to wipe them and use them for something else. You can say that the per gig price of SD cards is cheap, but per unit they don't go down to the price that videotapes got to. They're not like $3 a piece. For the speed class I need for my work, they're like $30 a piece, and, and really for this new camera here, uh, they're $200 a piece and I can't get smaller sizes. I'm using a two terabyte SSD to record this and that's the one I need. So I can't buy a new one for every shoot. I'm forced by economics and scale to keep reusing the same card over and over. I'm forced to erase my own creative contributions instead of leaving them on a medium where they could have wound up in the fossil record. And as a result, I may not be a part of history in 50 years. That sucks. And I don't think it had to be like this. Trevor Steers asks, uh, there's been a lot of effort made in cinema cameras to effectively emulate the look of 35mm film, um, with some work also done for 16 and even 8mm. Analog video had a look to it. The desaturated colors, the artifacts, light streaking. Do you think there's any value in emulating that? Or do you think most productions will just shoot actual video when that look is called for? I'm going to cop to not being knowledgeable enough to answer this. Uh, I can't even color grade my own work effectively. <laughs> I hardly understand what makes film look like film. But... I think the way I would put it is this. Back in 2001, I remember reading an introduction to still photography on photo.net. Um, by the way, I was a hobby still photographer for like a decade. I took a lot of photos I liked. Uh, I just got out of it because I couldn't get any feedback from anyone that made it feel worthwhile to me. But at any rate, I did it for a long time. Uh, now this introduction was talking about the critical factors of still photography, uh, shutter speed, aperture, and focus. And what it said about focus is that there's no value in getting it wrong. This article asserted that an image where everything is out of focus or where the subject is in somewhat unsharp focus is not just another artistic decision out of many, it's an error. I agreed with that. Now this is a very spicy take, and before anyone jumps in to argue, I want to remind you that this is art, I'm an artist, and artists often dislike each other's work, so it doesn't matter if I disagree with you. The point is, this is how I feel about the video look. When I had a VHS camera, all I wanted was for it to look a little less like VHS. And generally speaking, I've always been obsessed with great video quality, even if I don't have the skills to consistently obtain it. My hand is probably blown out right now. If I watch the video for uh, Say It Ain't So by Weezer, the blown out highlights uh, through the door in the background catch my eye and make me wrinkle my nose. I want to see cameras with incredible dynamic range so that doesn't happen. And when I shoot video of something and I review it afterwards and things are less colorful than they looked in real life, I try to fix that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I want everything crisp and colorful and in gamut. So my hope is that cameras just get exponentially better every year forever. The only value I can think of for the video look is to lend an air of cinema verite to things. Uh, the Blair Witch Project aside, uh, consider Trailer Park Boys, um, which feels real because they shot it on like Garbo DV camcorders. But in time, I think you know, that kind of association is going to fade as we forget the 90s, as cameras get better, etc. If nobody's doing a TV show right now in that same style, but shot on iPhones, they're missing a bet. But even iPhones will get better in time, and eventually we'll have to guess whether something is quote-unquote real footage based on maybe just the quality of the camera work. Except I don't even think that's going to work because apparently there's a GoPro now and has been for a while where you can flip it in the air in like a 360 and it'll keep the image perfectly stable using digital image stabilization. Like it just catches a, a massive image circle on its sensor and just crops it way the hell down. So it can do this trick where it's just rotating the part of the circle that it's cropping down to the final image. It's, it's completely wild. And eventually that technology is going to end up in iPhones and stuff. So 
I think that eventually everything's going to look like a Hollywood movie. Like the sensors in our phones and whatnot are going to capture like beautiful film log, massive gamut, enormous dynamic range, high frame rate, like you name it. They're going to be absolutely incredible. Everything is going to look like a movie. And honestly, I invite that because I want everyone to have cameras that good. If someone wants to emulate video, I mean, they're probably making a period film set in 1993 or something. So run it through an HDMI to composite converter and back or something. I don't know. Sabertail asks, when did piracy first start to become viable for the lay consumer? This is a fun question uh, because, and I mean no offense, it's actually completely backwards. The real question is, when did it stop? And even that is pretty complicated. First, uh, I'm gonna be unjustifiably pedantic uh, only because it serves my purposes. I assume that you mean computer software piracy because of course music piracy goes back to the first recordable music formats ever sold. Uh, probably even before quarter inch tape, I figure people were like getting record cutters and like dubbing 45s. I don't know if that's the order of operations when those things were released, but at any rate, people were copying books in the 18th century. Okay, so piracy goes back forever, all right? It is known, we all agree on that now. Also, in another egregious act of pedantry, I'm going to say that uh, software piracy is also not specific enough because software used to mean something different. Uh, it used to mean videotape, but I've seen in multiple magazines people using the term to refer to videotapes. You can buy software to use with your hardware, that being the videotape recorders people were buying uh, back in the 70s before they exploded into the average house. Uh, in fact, um, as I mentioned in my History of Video documentary, there was a like leftist organizing periodical built around uh, the concept of trading videotapes called Radical Software in the early 70s. This is totally irrelevant though. You obviously don't mean that. <laughs> Getting on point. Uh, well, Bill Gates wrote the open letter to hobbyists in 1976 uh, in which he complained about people making copies of Altair Basic, which was, if you think about it for a moment, uh, essentially one of the first computer programs ever sold as a retail product. So piracy goes way back to the beginning of computer software, uh, but nobody using computers at that time was a lay person. So we have to fast forward at least a little bit. I would say that the Apple II was being bought by average consumers when it came out in 1977. So I think that counts. Um, it did take a little bit for the first like pre-made retail programs to become available for that platform. Uh, based on my rudimentary research, I don't think you could really buy a program off the shelf for like the first couple years that the Apple II was on the market. Uh, but once that did happen, you had people without any prior computer knowledge who were buying an Apple II and then like a box copy of VisiCalc and I can't imagine why they wouldn't have gone home and used the utilities that came with the computer to copy VisiCalc and give it to a friend. So I would think that computer software piracy began the moment it was physically possible, which was almost the beginning of home computers at all. But to be fair to your question, um, it very quickly became less viable because software developers started finding ways to defeat disk copying. Uh, DRM goes back to the early 80s at a minimum, possibly the late 70s. So uh, fairly quickly, uh, you stopped being able to just copy disks. And that began a fascinating period of DRM usage surging in popularity and then uh, like rolling back as they got strong pushback from the public. And that period still hasn't ended, it's still going on. In the early to mid 80s, almost every uh, Apple II game and a lot of PC software had DRM of one kind or another. Uh, but if you fast forward to like the late 80s, there were ads in PC magazines for programs that proudly proclaimed that they were DRM free and that you could copy those diskettes uh, because people wanted to make backups of their software for legitimate reasons. They just weren't being stopped from making them for illegitimate ones as well. In 1995, for instance, you could copy Doom to a few floppies and give it to as many friends as you wanted illegally, but it wasn't difficult. Uh, but in 1996, uh, Duke Nukem 3D put a 600 megabyte junk file on the CD just to make it impractical for the average person to just go to a friend's house and copy the game off to their hard drive. The late 90s and 2000s brought us uh, thousands of games encumbered with various like CD-ROM copy protections like Secu-ROM. Uh, then Steam came out and started phoning home on top of it all, but uh, concurrently, GOG started selling old games and then modern games with the DRM legally stripped out, which you can once again put on a flash drive and hand to a friend. So it really has just come and gone and come and gone. With all that said though, uh, I think I'm being a little disingenuous with this answer. I just think this history is fascinating. I think the real answer to your question um, is that piracy became easy for the largest number of people when the first CD burners hit the market. Because at that time, uh, there were just more people using computers and, and less knowledgeable people using computers than ever before. 
um, but CD-based software wasn't yet largely copy protected. So there was a period from when CD burners became available, like 1997, to uh, before the spread of things like Securom, that had to have been the highest concentration of regular Joes copying software to give to coworkers and that sort of thing. So, so I think we could probably say that large-scale consumer software piracy really started in the late 90s. Andrew Roach asks, how do you listen to music? Bad news, everyone. While I absolutely love music, I'm almost the opposite of an audiophile. I mean, I, I love the way that music sounds, but my ears just aren't that sensitive. Uh, I actually used to work for an audiophile hardware manufacturer, which means that I've heard a $50,000 stereo system, and I've heard a $100,000 stereo system, and I can't tell the difference between those and my $300 studio monitors with torn cones from back when my monitor lizard got loose. She was trouble, but also very adorable. I used to feed her eggs. I later gave her away to a zoo. I also have, um, this is a brag, very diverse music interests. Um, I listen to a lot of uh, modern punk like uh, Jeff Rosenstock, Parquet Quartz, Pup, um, Folk Punk, uh, AJJ, Ramshackle Glory, and all sorts of other crap. Alt-J, ABBA. Sometimes I listen to Ben Folds or Bright Eyes for a week straight, or I get stuck on like B-Born Beton or like one album by VNV Nation. So I just have too much stuff to own everything outright. Uh, as much as I wish I could. And since I'm not particularly sensitive to audio quality, I just use Spotify. I'm sorry, I'm the bastard. One of the reasons I use Spotify though is that uh, I move a lot from my PC to my phone and I don't like experiences to get interrupted. So if I'm listening to an album on my PC, uh, I can go to my phone, put on my Bluetooth headset and just press play and it'll pick up right where I left off, literally in the middle of a track. And there's no other technology in existence that can do that. So I'm kind of stuck. Don't get me wrong, I dislike a lot of things about Spotify, um, particularly how little they pay artists. Uh, I wish they would let me pay more money and divide that money fairly among the people I listen to. If I could pay $40 a month, and then if I listened to only Jeff Rosenstock for that whole month, he would just get a $30 check. That would be ideal, but there's nothing I can do about that, so I'm, I'm just kind of stuck. I did buy all his albums anyway. I do listen to some stuff that isn't on Spotify. Um, like Sometimes I'll listen to Neil Cicerega's uh, Mouth albums, which I consider pure high art. Uh, and I also listen to like Amiga tracker music. And for all that, I use FUBAR 2000, which is the only remaining good program on the PC. Vance asks, what was your best ever thrift store find? Uh, this is a toughie. Um, I've forgotten much of what I found at thrift stores and a lot of it was kind of middling anyway. A lot of my really cool stuff, I hate to say it, but I get it from eBay uh, or I get it from donations or from friends who got it from yet another place. But I, I can name two things that together constitute a good answer to this question. And they're both cameras, sorry. The first is my Hitachi VK-C800 video tube camera uh, because it was just the first one of that type that I'd found. It was the first EIAJ compatible camera I'd ever seen. Um, I got that, I think, after I'd been doing YouTube uh, for quite a while already. Um, and I still haven't actually featured it on the channel except as a still image in my history of video documentary. Um, but it basically put me on the path to get hyped about video and forgotten video history um, and just video in general, really. I was collecting a lot of computer stuff before that because I just... That's what I knew and, and I was used to, but uh, that camera really rekindled a dormant fascination that I'd had with camcorders and video my whole life, uh, and which I'd given up on finding any further joy in. Like I had owned a couple camcorders, I thought I knew what there was to know about them, uh, and I'd long since moved on from caring about this, but buying this thing really kickstarted my interest, and as you've certainly seen by now, that was essential to me both as a collector and to my channel in terms of having a sense of identity. That Hitachi wasn't actually all that cool in itself though, like it doesn't do my, that much other than shoot bad video footage. Uh, it just got me into this stuff again. Um, I'd say the most intrinsically cool thing I ever got at a thrift store, uh, well it was an eBay store, but same difference, uh, was my Sony Betacam. Hang on. That's, uh, that's this guy, and uh, I know I did a whole video about all my various large cameras I own, but this was the first one I bought. I walked into a RePC in Seattle and I found this for $20. And it reminded me for the first time in a very, very long time that I had always looked at news cameras and gone, oh man, I want one of those. But rightly, I had always assumed that they were like $30,000 and I would never have an opportunity to touch one. And this made me aware that old ones could be had for very little money. So that got me into collecting these and everything else kind of went from there. For 20 bucks, I think this thing did more to fire my imagination than really anything else I've ever bought. Zephram Marks asks, or uh, maybe rather ruminates, one thing I was just thinking recently, the move away from VHS video meant you couldn't just plug the tape into your TV anymore. You require the camera or an intermediate step. I'm not even sure if it's solved today. Some cameras can stream to TV, but only if you have compatible vendors. 
Yeah, that's a bummer, right? I think about this a lot. Um, I don't want to sound super demeaning towards the quote-unquote average individual, but I can't really picture what a lot of people do with standalone camcorders uh, in this regard. I've remarked in videos that they're easier than ever to use, but I think the only time in history that camcorders were truly as easy to use as people wanted was the VHS era, uh, where you just took the tape out and slammed it into your VCR. After that, it just jumps over this huge threshold of inconvenience, and I don't know what a lot of people did about that. Yeah, you can plug the camcorder into your TV, but a ton of people can't even hook up a VCR, right? So um, there's rarely anything you can put your camera's memory card in that'll let you play the video directly on your TV, and the workflow of getting video into a computer and then out into some usable physical form is really daunting. Like, it was kind of doable in, like, 2006, when you could get Windows Movie Maker, edit something down, and, and maybe burn a DVD, uh, but cheap video editing software is gone except for impenetrable open source sludge, DVDs are mostly dead, um, and that whole thing was pretty tough to do in the first place. So I have no idea what most people do with the footage from standalone camcorders. Maybe it's just fairly savvy people who buy them and the rest, well, they use their phones now. Very Dragons asks, uh, what's a tech phenomenon you wish you could have experienced while it was in its heyday and why? Do you feel like there's a comparable way to achieve whatever that same sort of feeling may have been today? Uh, conversely, what phenomenon did you experience you feel is no longer something that can be experienced in the same way? Uh, is that a loss? And if you think so, what sort of thing would you want people today uh, to know about it? Uh, again, a lot of energy in this one. I don't know that I can answer any of this directly, but let's give it a shot. What phenomenon do I wish I could have experienced? Uh, I think, again, I got to go back to early HD video. Uh, if you don't know this, there was analog video in the late 80s that got 1080i quality at 60 FPS, and it looked spectacular. Um, here's a demo laser disc that you can find in its entirety on YouTube. Uh, there'll be a link in the description. I think this is from 1990. It looks spectacular, and I wish I could have had the experience of seeing this happen right in front of my eyes in an era when the best thing I'd ever seen on a TV screen was SVHS. But I think since that didn't go anywhere, maybe it's not quite what you mean. Uh, so honestly, what I wish I'd been there for was 90s console video games. Uh, I had a time-shifted childhood, kind of complicated, but a lot of my technology was way out of date. Uh, so I was playing an NES in like 1999, and uh, until like 2001, I had never touched an SNES, a PlayStation, or an N64. Uh, I'd seen a PlayStation 2 in person uh, once, and I'd seen blurry, low-res video footage of all of these systems, but I'd never had or used any of them. Later on, in like 2003, um, I downloaded illegal ROMs of every 8- and 16-bit video game in existence, and I enjoyed things like Chrono Trigger uh, quite a lot, but not with the kind of purity of experience the people who were there for the release and heyday of these games uh, enjoyed. And I've seen people talk about what it was like uh, to be there, and it sounds like so much fun. I wish I'd gotten to play Super Mario World when it was still fairly fresh, or be floored by Final Fantasy VII, a game which I will never be able to appreciate as the groundbreaking achievement that it was. I don't know that these feelings can be replicated. Um, for complicated reasons, again, I don't think I'll ever be impressed by a new game, and I missed out on most of the seminal ones in the past, and, and that bums me out. As for what I experienced that others missed, well, truth be told, I spent most of my days growing up just wasting time on the computer, so most of my experiences of earlier eras were just sitting on the PC, really, and um, there's only one thing that really stands out about that. It sort of applies to everything now, so it's kind of cheating, but I'll go for it. What I recall about computing 20 years ago is that it could be lonely. The feeling that craft work captured in computer love, uh, the sensation of, you know, sitting in a dark room with a monitor with some terse computer nonsense on it and just silently plodding through the night, tapping away at some inscrutable task, is something that's dead and gone forever. Nowadays, the internet is always there. Everything we do is is connected to it. We're, we're always connected to it, even if we're not near it. You can leave your smartphone and your laptop in the other room, but you know it's there. Hell, you can go out to the middle of the forest, you know, be a thousand miles away from the internet, and you can think about anything, and you'll still have the buzz of other people in your head. The internet made everything social. We're never alone. We're always haunted by thousands of faceless ghosts. On every subject, we know that there's a rando out there who has already thought about it before. And when I contrast that feeling with the memory of sitting in a room at midnight trying to make a graphics card work with nothing but a terse manual, um, or reading a website that was written by one person instead of millions, yeah, I feel like we lost something. But I think this is just what it means to get older in the modern world, where every 10 years, existence gets 10% louder, and every generation looks back and says, I wish it could be quieter again. So, sorry, I don't think I can answer your question. Brad Sparks asks, if you could remake any major technology to your own ideals, what would it be? I could spend six years reimagining the PC with an unlimited budget. 
unlimited power, and I still, I, I don't think I would be satisfied. It's, it's why I'm not doing a channel about modern computers, because they frustrate me to no end. But that would be what I would put my effort into. Like, if I could snap my fingers and just change how the personal computer works in every conceivable way, I would. I, I don't remotely have the time to go into what frustrates me about them. It's endless. Take, take your pick. If you can think of a design element of a modern PC, trust me, I hate it. Josh Dick asks, what emotions, if any, do you feel towards equipment in your collection that's hibernating in storage? Uh, preservation, a dignified sleep, parts of the dragon's hoard, dusty, long-forgotten objects that are still happy and waiting to be useful at a moment's notice? Like I said, this one kind of came at me from an angle, but it's a good question. I wouldn't be collecting this stuff if I didn't care about it. I, I own very little that does not, in some way, spark joy. It's just that my interests and appreciation for things are really wide-ranging, so the bar for that is pretty low. I could give some specific examples about what I've got in storage. Um, I've got a 20-inch Sony SSM in there. Uh, it's basically a PVM without the RGB inputs, so nobody really cares about them. It's actually intended, I think, as a security monitor, but it's just as good as a PVM if you're doing composite or S-video. Um, the picture's really outstanding, and it's a huge monitor, right? It's a great... It's a PVM, it just doesn't have the RGB. I think a lot about how somebody out there would really love to have this thing, but I did try Craigslisting it and nobody bit, and I really don't want it to go into a hoard or get picked up by some vulture who's going to flip it on eBay with a title like Super Smash Brothers, Vintage TV, Sony, PVM, Gamer, Look! I don't really want to sell it on the open market. I want to meet someone who's trying to get into video, or I guess someone who wants to do retro gaming but hasn't been bit by the RGB bug, uh, and just give it to them. And I worry sometimes that it won't survive long enough for me to do that. Um, maybe this is the sentiment you're looking for, I don't know, but I, I know I could give this thing to someone. There are people who would take it right now from me, but I'm waiting for the right person. For a lot of other stuff, it's weird because I often get things because they kindle some sort of intrigue in me, which I haven't yet figured out how to explain or do anything with. So. They just sit there. And I sometimes feel bad that I have more or less a hoard of stuff that's just sitting there. But I do at least have it because I wanted to enhance other people's lives with it. And that's why I still have it. I don't really feel sad about any of this stuff. Um, I mostly feel frustration at the fact that a lot of it is as rare as it is. So many things have just been thrown away instead of being given to people who could appreciate them uh, or at least store them for, for future interest. And I wish we had some plan for solving this for old stuff or new stuff. There's stuff being made right now, which is going to end up in a landfill instead of being, you know, put somewhere for a future generation. It, it's guaranteed. It's born destined for the trash. There's gobs of empty space in the world, uh, but we just throw away functioning devices instead of keeping, you know, at least a few specimens so we can remember what we did. Um, this doesn't really scale, I know. We can't just keep everything but I wish I could send all my stuff to some like vast warehouse complex for safekeeping, and then I could make a pilgrimage there, and it would just be there among vacuum cleaners and washing machines uh, and, and microscopes and, and who knows what, and I could just borrow whatever I want to investigate, and somebody else could borrow the stuff I put there, you know? Uh, but I don't think it's practical, <laughs> ever. Oh well. Zephyr Marks double dips with a second question, which I respect. Do you ever see yourself working with a museum or opening one yourself? Uh, I'd love to do that. You mentioned old tech and how things were done in the past and the development of the standards we have today. I, I would love to do that with all sorts of things, right? I think about this all the time, and I don't know there could ever be a reality in our like terminally broken economy. I can't see a future where I have the money to afford the space I would need to do that out here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, renting a tool shed here costs a fortune, let alone the amount of space you'd need for a museum. Um, case in point, we actually have or had the Living Computer Museum, um, which is or was pretty cool. It closed due to the pandemic and might not ever reopen because Paul Allen's estate is a bunch of ghouls. And it was far too focused in its scope, if you ask me, but it was pretty cool. And to wit, the only reason it ever existed is because Paul Allen wanted it to and he was a billionaire. Without that kind of money, it's, it's nearly impossible to afford the space for a museum in this region, and I can't see myself moving to Oklahoma where I could afford to get a 100,000 square feet for like a cool thousand a month. So it just doesn't seem like a possibility, but believe me, I'd, I'd jump at the chance. Combining this question with the last question, um, what am I gonna do with all this stuff? I mean, I just keep getting new stuff. People are donating things and I'm finding cool stuff on eBay. I just upgraded my storage unit because I ran out of space everywhere. My house and my storage unit were completely full. I had to get a new one. And that's going to fill up too. And I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to hoard this stuff forever. There has to be an end. And I don't know what it is. I've got to get rid of my all my computers, my video cameras and whatnot. They've got to move on to someone, but I don't know what to do about that. I wish I could send a lot of this to museums, but I don't know of any. Um, and I can't bring myself to throw most of it away. 
I wish we had some sort of like community trading program for moving this stuff around uh, between people who will, you know, use it or curate it. But that sort of thing is just a mess of logistical and social pitfalls. If anyone has plans to like get together and replace or reboot the LCM with something a little less stale, a little more diversified and uh, not owned by Paul Allen's estate, hit me up. You, you can't imagine the amount of free labor that I would put into that project. Finally, uh, PT says, I just want to say I really enjoy your videos. All of them. Thank you. Thank you, too. All of you. Um, I don't know if I'll be famous by doing this or if I want to be. I don't know if I'll even be doing this in a couple of years, uh, but it's been really nice to have people care about what I care about, at least for the time being. It's really remarkable that people are willing to pay me to do this, too. And speaking of which, I'm sure I'll do more of these Q&As in the future. Uh, so if you want to get a question in, consider subscribing to my Patreon. The link in the description and uh, keep an eye out for future Q&A posts. Uh, but whether you do or don't, thanks again for watching.